Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, we're really excited for this event. All month long, we've been celebrating our epic Earth. So talking to scientists and explorers from all over the world uh, who work in incredible places, do amazing conservation work, and then bring a lot of that work uh, to us, to the general public. So we're really excited for today. We've got Andy Whitworth hanging out with us. He is a wildlife conservationist, a National Geographic Explorer, and the Director of Ecological Restoration and Biodiversity Conservation with the OSA Conservation in Costa Rica. So he uses camera traps to capture pictures and videos of secretive species that can spend their entire lives high above the ground in the rainforest. And the OSA Peninsula, many of you may not know, is home to half of the species in Costa Rica. So that's a staggering uh, amount of biodiversity in such a small uh, spot on the Earth's surface. You can see right now we have Andy hanging out for us in the canopy. Andy, it is so great to have you joining us live from the Costa Rican jungle. Yeah, no, it's great to be here. All right, awesome. Well, we've got awesome group of classrooms joining us from Canada, from the US. We've got even more who are starting to tune in live on YouTube. So classrooms on YouTube, don't forget, you can still get in on the action. Introduce yourselves in the chat sidebar, send us in some questions, and we'll work those in. But Andy, I'm going to throw things to you for a little bit. We're excited to learn a little bit more about just what you're doing so high off the ground. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's uh, thanks for having me, Joe, and uh, welcome to uh, to the Rainforest Canopy to all you guys all over the world. It's amazing that we can uh, bring you up here with us. So right now I'm about um, 25 meters up in the canopy and I'm in a, a beautiful fig tree. So figs are really important food resources for wildlife in the canopy. So they're a great place to come and study the wildlife. They've got these huge branches I'm going to show you. So you can see them like jutting off into the, the canopy out there. And that's where the animals are obviously moving around. They're the arboreal highways up off the ground. So what one of my projects is, is to set up camera traps. So rather than just using camera traps on the ground, on the trails, we hit them in the trees. So I'm gonna show you a camera trap now. So here we go. There's a camera trap, you guys can see that. And it's got a lens just here in the middle. It's got um, some infrared lights on the top there and then it's got this sensor here so when animals are moving around it can pick up their movement and then it starts to film and we can set the cameras either to take photographs or videos so we'll set them on the tree like this looking out on some branches and then that gives us an insight into how animals who live up in the rainforest canopy are actually using the rainforest and we can understand how um, we might be disturbing them as people by maybe cutting down rainforest and we're disturbing the highways. And what we're finding is that the arboreal species like the spider monkeys that are an endangered species or kinkajous and porcupines that roam around at nighttime, they're more sensitive than the species that move around on the ground. And that's because they've got these very complex systems up in the rainforest canopy um, that people are um, playing with. So that's part of what I'm, I'm trying to do is understand more about how wildlife use rainforest canopies. And um, just like Joe said, Ossa Peninsula is incredible because we've got half of all the species in Costa Rica, but rainforest canopies also have over half of all species as well. So if we only study wildlife on the ground, then we're missing so much biodiversity. I'm gonna give you a sense of where I am as well. So. You can see I'm right up in the treetops here. So these are the upper branches. And then I'm gonna show you my dangling legs. So there you go. And you can see my ropes just disappearing into the ground down there. And this is actually a medium sized tree. Oh, so some of the trees we do are double this height. They're up to 40 meters. And that's where you get the really like big eagles up there, like harp eagles and crested eagles love to nest in those giant trees. So yeah, that's uh, a little bit of the work that we're doing um, up here in the canopy. So I'll, I'll throw it back over to Joe and maybe you guys have got some questions. Absolutely, Andy. So um, just to get things started, can you tell us a little bit um, more about the peninsula itself? Uh, it's a spot that I think some students might not have heard of, but it is just, a, you know, as we've said, a treasure for biodiversity on the planet. Yeah, absolutely. So. The Osta Peninsula, a peninsula is like a little bit of land that juts out into the ocean, right? 
And, and what that means is that this peninsula at various um, periods of time geologically was an island. So that when the oceans were higher, this was an island. And then when the ocean's lower, it's connected to the mainland. So you've got many species of uh, animals, many types of animals that we call endemics. So what that means is this is the only place in the world that you can see them. So there's a, a really beautiful bird called a yellow-billed cotinga. It's one of the only places in the world that you can see that bird. We've got a tiny poison dart frog, and it's the only place in the world that you can see this particular species of poison dart frog. So we've got incredible levels of what we call endemism. So these unique species. Um, and the peninsula is just fantastic for that. And because it's right in the south of Costa Rica, it's one of the last wild places. So there's not big populations of people. So there's really good forest cover and there's lots of animals. We've still got jaguars and white-lit peccaries down here, which is just fantastic. Yeah, and I think that's a, a really good point to bring up, Andy, is that Costa Rica in general, the government has done a really good job of preserving and protecting wild spaces. Can you tell the students a little bit about that? Yeah, Costa Rica has been really an environmental pioneer in, in the field of conservation and environment. And what happened is uh, just over 30 years ago, they brought in some incredible forest laws that meant that we had to keep the riparian areas. So the areas around the river systems, it's illegal to deforest them. So you've got to keep those forested. So it means you've got good connectivity and uh, areas for animals to pass through and you help to keep water quality good. And what they also did was brought in a no-cut forest law um, and, and unique payment for ecosystem services. So it's where farmers and landowners can receive money for keeping forest intact. And so what they've done is they've doubled forest cover in 30 years. So a really short time frame, Costa Rica went from 25% forest cover to 52% forest cover. So they're a great example of um, how if we want to change things in the world for better, with the right conditions, we can do it and we can do it really quickly. So it's a really great good news story for conservation. All right. Absolutely. So there, I mean, it's a great model for other countries uh, to follow along as well. All absolutely. Right. All right. Well, let's take a little spin through our classrooms. Let's get to meet some of our classrooms. I'm sure they have some questions about the gear and the heights and all kinds of things, the animals that you see. So let's uh, let's start meeting some of our classrooms. Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's see. Let's get rolling uh, with Mrs. Butler's class. They're hanging out with us in Virginia Beach in Virginia. So I'm gonna turn their microphone on. How are we doing Virginia Beach? Good, how are you? Hi. Hi. Right there. Look, look at the camera. All right, here's your question. Go ahead and read your question. Do animals do if there's a storm? Sorry, can what you? What do animals do if there's a storm? Oh, that's a great question. I'd love to know what they do. You know what I think they do? I think they grab a hold like this. <laughs> no, it's a great question because we get some big storms. Right now we're in dry season, so it's nice and sunny. But in around June, July and August, the, the first rain start and the storms come and these trees sway around like a few meters either side. And I've been up in the trees when they're swaying around and it is scary. Um, but honestly, they're just so well adapted to, they're not like me where I'm like dangling on a rope. These guys are incredible acrobats. And uh, a lot of the monkeys out here have got prehensile tails so they can wrap their tails around the branches and they just hold on really, really tight. Um, but yeah, it must be pretty scary for them. Great question. That's a great question. And you brought up a really good point, Andy. This is a massive ecosystem. Uh, and it's an ecosystem that's so far away from us that uh, we know so little about it. And, you know, that's what you're trying to do with these camera traps, these video and these camera traps to shed a little light uh, on a, a habitat that we rarely get to see. Exactly. I think there's two big ecosystems on, on Earth that we know next to nothing about. One is the deep ocean and the other is the rainforest canopy. All right. Very cool. Well, it's amazing that we're able to hang out in that ecosystem today. Pretty awesome. So we're going to head to Mrs. Salazar's class. They are hanging out with us in Laredo, Texas. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Texas? Hey, hey guys. 
Who's up? Okay, go. Uh, what do you do whenever you drop something? Whenever you drop something, what do you do? Ah, uh, what do we do when I drop something? So I have to be really careful about um, trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so usually when I'm working in the tree, I'll set up some kind of um, rig system um, that has lots of loops on it. And I use carabiners to kind of lock everything in. I'm going to try and show you on my belt here. So I've got all these carabiners. And you can see I've got a bag here and it's locked off with this carabiner. And I'm just trying to honestly work really safely. But sometimes it does happen. And um, that's why the guys that are on the ground. So I've always got usually two people on the ground for safety in case of an emergency. Um, they're all wearing helmets as well. So if I do drop anything, um, I'm not going to knock them out. But uh, yeah, I suppose I made a few mistakes early on. But usually now I'm pretty good about not dropping things. <laughs> but it does happen sometimes. All right. Very cool. Well, you learn from experience. You learn on the job. You sure do. All right. We're heading to Richfield, Minnesota. We've got some fourth graders hanging out with Mr. Pregler. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, fourth graders? Good! Uh, I have a question. Um, how long have you been there and what animals have you seen? Oh, okay. Right. Well, I've been in the Costa Rican rainforest for three years now. Um, and before that, I was in the Amazon rainforest for just over eight years. So over 10 years now living and working in the rainforest. So I've been really lucky that I've seen a lot of wildlife. Um, my, I suppose I've seen a lot of the incredible things. Like when I've been up in the canopy, I've seen um, spider monkeys, obviously, going around through the trees. Beautiful big scarlet macaws just flying through the canopy. And they're really noisy. They make a crazy sound. Um, but what I really loved is some of the small things that I've seen. So I've seen um, pit vipers. So um, venomous snakes that kind of coil up in some of the branches and leaves. Um, I've seen them high up in the canopy at like 30 or 40 meters up there. And I love snakes. So the pit vipers for me um, are really cool little uh, things I found in the canopy. And then every now when I'm working up here, I'll see different types of lizards and different bugs and insects. Um, but there's just so many things to see, so many things to find. Um, and on the ground, I've, I've seen things like uh, white lip peccaries are awesome. They're these like wild pigs that go around in huge herds. And then you usually get the jaguars following the, the wild pigs. So I've seen jaguar three times now. And then just last week, I was walking down the road and I saw a tiny, a small cat called an ocelot just ran across the road in front of me. So I've been really lucky. All right. Absolutely amazing. Uh, let's see. Let's jump to. Oh, actually, before we jump to our next class, I want to give a shout out to our YouTube classrooms. We've got a lot of classrooms starting to tune in now. So use the chat sidebar on the right. Introduce yourself. Send us in some questions. And to all the classrooms tuning in today. Take some pictures of your class in action, uh, post them online, tag us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. You can tag uh, Andy at Andy Rainforest because we want to see pictures of your classrooms in action. All right. Ms. Gallo's group hanging out with us in Toronto, Ontario. Let me get your microphone turned on. Uh, there it is. Yeah, How are we doing, Toronto? Hey. What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, Okay, day to day. Well, you know, that kind of changes. That's one of the best things about um, my job. Um, so sometimes I can be doing uh, stuff kind of like you guys sat in a, a classroom or an office, and I'm looking at data. So I'm doing some coding and some analysis and exploring the information that we found. And then I've got to type that up and publish scientific articles so that the information that we get goes out around the world. Um, and it inspires other people to do similar kinds of work. And, and it's really nice. So I've seen my work now. People uh, are doing similar projects in all around the world, in Africa and parts of Asia. People are starting to explore rainforest canopies. Um, so it's just incredible to be able to see that message go out. Um, and then on other days when I'm on expedition and I'm out in the forest, 
I usually wake up really early. Um, the, it gets light here at about 5.30 and the howler monkeys start calling. So you, they kind of wake you up and you start your day around 5.30. Um, and it's nice and cool in the mornings. So that's when I like to start climbing. I, I like to go out by like 6, 6.30. Um, and that's when I want to get up in the canopy and get the cameras set up. And I want to kind of be down from the trees by around 11 because it gets really hot. Um, and then I kind of go to the biological station where all the other researchers and students and scientists are hanging out, have lunch, talk about what are the projects other people are doing. Um, and then I might go back out in the afternoon, do some more climbing. And then obviously in the evenings, it's dark at like 5.30, 6 p.m. here. So I'll kind of watch the sunset over the Pacific Ocean. Um, and then in the evenings, I'll sort a lot of the data. So you've got to like, collect the SD cards and then start organizing the data so that you can actually do some research with it. So I'm really lucky because it's super varied. And, um, and then sometimes I have students coming out to the rainforest to, uh, to learn about what we do. And so sometimes I'm doing some teaching as well. All right. Well, that sounds like an awesome gig. And I especially like the way you spend your evenings. Wouldn't be too <laughs> happy to see uh, that view each night. Yeah, it's, it's paradise. All right, let's jump to our next classroom. We are going to go, let's see, Miss, Miss Thompson's group. They're hanging out in Peterborough, Ontario. Looks like some grade sixes there. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Peterborough? All right. Can, has any of your, has any monkey, I mean, animal stolen part of your equipment? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting. So most of the animals kind of, they're not scared of the camera traps, but they're aware of them and they kind of, some of them will just ignore them. So kind of how the monkeys tend to like look at them, but they don't ever touch the camera trap. But there's two species that always go and play with my cameras and they, they're really mischievous and they try and pull them off the tree or they try and bite them. So one of those is the capuchin monkey. So capuchins are one of the, the most intelligent monkeys in the world. And they spot the cameras and they'll try and go straight over and they start looking and they start grabbing and they start bite, biting. They're, they're, re they're a real problem for me. Um, and the other animal that people, a lot of people don't, don't know too much about is a species called the kinkajou. So a kinkajou is in its own family. It's, it's not a monkey. It's in a family called the Proconidae. And they're nocturnal, so they go around at nighttime. And they are very much like the captains, very mischievous. But they tend to go around on their own. They're kind of solitary. So they don't go around uh, like the captains in big groups, in big gangs. Um, but they always come and sniff and bite the camera traps. So yeah, those two species in particular are real, uh, a real problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, this is Deer's class, grade seven's hanging out in Chesapeake, Virginia. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Chesapeake? Oops, sorry, we're doing now. That's okay. All right, who is up? Um, this is Taylor, here we go. Hi, have hey. you ever had issues with animals being mean or aggressive? Um, you know, I, I really haven't had any species be kind of, it's, it's never ended up being dangerous for me, um, with, with most of the species that you'd expect. Sometimes I'll get like, a you know, a male spider monkey or, uh, a male captain who kind of comes over and they'll like shake the branches and they you know, the, you can see that they're a bit irritated and they're like confused about why you're in their tree. Um, but they've never physically kind of attacked me. So they don't to be, seem to be too much of a problem. The one animal that has attacked me and is really dangerous is, are the Africanized honeybees. So I was, um, this was about uh, a year and a half ago now. And I was actually on the ground working the, the lines on the ground. And I had a friend up in the tree uh, and he started screaming and he was being attacked by Africanized bees. And um, it was a really dangerous situation. 
um, and he was getting stung by hundreds and hundreds of bees. But luckily, with the climbing system that I use, you guys can probably see I've got one and two ropes. So I've got like a safety rope on, on here. This is my safety. And I've also got, you probably, I'm going to try and show you, these ropes here go down to a pulley system on the ground. So when I was on the ground, I could use the pulley system and lower him to the ground. But I was getting stung by hundreds of bees as well. Um, so I had to get him to hospital. Um, and they put him on an intravenous strip and he was, he was fine a couple of hours later. But that's the scariest animal was the Africanized honeybees. Because in the dry season now, um, that's when they've got lots of honey. So they get very defensive over the honey. So if you make too much noise and you're in the wrong tree, uh, the honeybees are really dangerous. All right. Sounds pretty wild, but it's good to hear that you have some safety systems uh, in place. Yeah. Something like that does happen. So I want to give a shout out uh, to Miss Holden's group in Alberta, grade threes. They just said hey to us on YouTube. So don't forget to send us in uh, a question from Alberta. Uh, but Andy, before uh, we do another round of questions with our classrooms, I think you mentioned that you might try to put the trap up. Yeah, I'm going to try and put the trap up. So that's what I'm, I'm getting into place now. So let's see how I do with this. <laughs> Can you guys kind of see the tree in front of me there? Yep. All right, so I'm going to try and do this. So we might find out what happens when I drop something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's the camera, right? You guys can see the camera? Yep. All right, so I'm just gonna be working away. So I'm gonna put this strap in here around the back of the camera. This holds it in place. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open the camera and I'm just gonna check my batteries and then I'm gonna turn it on to setup. So hopefully, I now have a red light and my screen's coming on. And then I'm going to set my date and time. So it's the 17th of January, 25 past nine. So I don't have any photographs yet, but I'm just going to set this to, I'm going to set it to take video. So it's going to set on video. And then we're going to take we're going to take 15 seconds of video and we're going to have like a 10 second interval between the videos. Okay. So now I'm just going to close it quickly and I'm just going to make sure I don't drop you guys. So far just so give good. Me a second. Yeah. So far so good. I'm just going to lower myself a little bit more so I can get closer to this tree. All right, here we go. Here we go. All right, so then I'm going to put my strap around. This is the key now. You've got to be careful not to drop this at this point. I'm going to tighten that there. All right, super. So now my camera's almost set. So you can see this here. So what we can do is I'm going to make sure it's looking out at those branches over there. So these are the branches I'm pointing at. Uh, you guys are basically what the camera trap's going to see now. So I'm looking for animals moving around on those branches. And then it's really quite simple at this stage. I'm going to open up. What I do need to be careful is that the batteries haven't fallen and we're all looking good. And then I just flick the camera. They're really easy to use. So I'm gonna try and get in tight. So I've got my batteries, oh, my screen's on. And there's an SD card under here that stores all the data. And I just flick it to on, close it up. And you can see the light should be flashing now, which means that the camera is going to arm. And we're good. That's it. So they're really sweet, really easy to use little devices. So the trickiest thing is getting them up there. But that camera is now on. So when the animals come across those branches, 
we're going to be filming. All right. Very impressive. Well done. And I didn't drop you guys. No. Awesome. Very cool. Well, let's jump into our classrooms and see if they have a follow-up for us. So let's go to Mrs. Butler's class again, see if they have another question for us. All right. Here comes Daniel. All right, Daniel, nice and loud. Ask him your question. What is your favorite sound in the rainforest? Oh, my favorite sound. Huh. Oh, that's, a, that's an awesome question. I'm trying to figure out what my favorite sound is. You know what? I think it might be there's, because there's so many sounds. Um, do you, what I also have, guys, actually, is um, I should share it with Joe later. We have some devices up in the canopy that stream the sounds of the rainforest. Um, but my favorite sound is when the wet season comes. So it's really dry right now. But when the rains start in a few months, we get these explosive uh tree frog events so hundreds of thousands of these tree frogs come into the ponds and they just make an incredible sound um and there's like five species all calling at once and it's just a real um cacophony of noise and sound and it's just phenomenal i love it because uh after a long dry period um, it's a nice sign of the rains and the water for the rainforest as well. So I love the frogs. All right. Very cool. Well, Andy, afterwards, if you want to share those links with me, or if you have any uh, pictures or little videos to share with the classrooms, I think they get a kick out of that. Absolutely. Yeah. I've got some really nice video footage from the, the cameras as well. Perfect. Let's go back to Texas. Ms. Salazar's group is with us. Your microphone is on. Oh, that's cool. Who's asking? Oh, 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 oh. What's your opinion on uh, 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 what's your opinion on the pygmy anteater? My opinion on 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 what? The, the pygmy anteater. Oh, he saw it. On the anteater. Yeah, he's asking about the pygmy anteater. Have you ever? Ah, what do you think the about them? Pygmy anteater. Yeah, I mean that. So for a long time, that was my. Um, that's the animal that I wanted to see the most. So when I was in the Amazon for nine years, I never saw one. Um, I only ever saw it on the camera traps. So that was really cool, right? When I was working in a place and I'd never seen the silky anteater, it's a tiny little anteater that could fit in my hand. It's so cute. And in Ecuador, they call it, um, they call it the flor de balsa because it looks like a, a balsa tree flower. It's really furry. Um, and what was amazing when I came to Costa Rica, I got to see one in life for the first time. And uh, it was in a really weird place. There was a guy who has a farm on the peninsula and this little pygmy anteater was living in the trees uh, in the fence line of his farm. And it's just awesome. One of my favorite animals. We, we know really nothing about them. So for anybody who wants to be a, a wildlife biologist and find out some new, some new things about an animal, the silky pygmy anteater would be an awesome animal to study. I'd love to get some little radio transmitters and find out where those things go and what they do. But yeah, that's a fantastic animal. All right, very cool. I hope the classrooms take some time to, to Google that afterwards and check out some pictures. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Thompson's class, your microphone is on. What is the most expensive equipment that you've dropped? <laughs> the most expensive bit of equipment. Well, I, I suppose really um, it was one of the camera traps. Um, so the camera traps, you, you can get some cheap ones now. They're, they're, they've come down in price. So you can get a pretty, a reasonable Bushnell camera trap for about $120. But the camera that I dropped was a, a Reconyx which was a, a $400 camera trap and uh, I dropped it to the ground. But luckily it still worked. So I got away with it. All right, they're trying to get you to tell all the embarrassing stories now. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see, Mr. Pregler's group, let's get your microphone back on for another question. All right, go ahead. Cheers. How do you repel it up into the tree? All right, cool. Good question. 
So I'll tell you a little bit about the whole process. So first of all, when we find a tree and we've got to know that it's a safe tree to climb, right? We've got to know, ideally we want to know what species of tree it is. So some trees are really soft and some trees are really hard. So you've got to get really good at botany and you want to be able to learn your trees or work with someone that does. Uh, and then we've got to find a nice healthy tree and we want to fire the line over. So we use a giant catapult to fire a little weight bag and a thin line over. And then we pull over the big heavy lines, these two big heavy lines. And then to get up there, what you can see here, I've got like a chest harness. I'm trying to pull this in. And I've got this thing here called a chest harness. And I put my rope inside here. It's like a little clip. And then what I do is I use this hand ascender here that clips into the rope. And I pull myself up on the rope and the rope slides through the chest ascender. And then to get down, I use this piece of kit here. This is called uh, a descender, an, I, a, an ID. I'm just going to show you the front of it. So this, it has a handle that comes around. Can you see that? There we go. So it has a handle. And if I pull the handle, my rope slides through there and I rappel down. So I'm going to show you guys at the end of the video, I'm going to, I'm going to try and rappel down so you can see it in action. All right. Very cool. Great question. Um, let's see. We need to go to our class in Toronto. Let me get your microphone turned back on. There we go. We're ready. What is the apex predator in the rainforest, excluding humans? All right. So which of the predators, am I getting this right? Which of the predators in the rainforest other than humans? Yeah. Have the biggest impact. Yeah. Yeah. All ah, right. Okay. Okay. So this is, um, that's actually a really interesting question. So predators, I mean, predators are really important in any kind of ecosystem. So it sounds like predators are a negative impact, right? Um, but actually predators are a really good um, impact for an ecosystem. Um, maybe not humans. Uh, but thinking about um, closer to home to you guys, um, with wolves. So when wolves were reintroduced uh, into parts of the US, they had a really positive impact on the ecosystem because they control uh, the herbivores and some of the species lower down in the food chain. So here in the rainforest, um, I suppose the one that everybody knows about is the jaguar. So the jaguar is the real big apex predator on the ground. But up here in the rainforest canopy, it's different. So the big predators here, there's two big eagles. Well, there's lots of big eagles, but the two real big ones are the harpy eagle and the crested eagle. And they're enormous. They've got wingspans bigger than I am tall. Uh, and they'll pluck sloths and monkeys out of the canopy. Um, so they're pretty impressive predators. Um, the other one that's a great aerial predator is there's a bat called Vampirum spectrum. And it's huge. It has a, like a big two foot wingspan. And they specialize on pu uh, pulling birds off their perches in the dark at nighttime. And then they'll eat the birds. So those are all pretty uh, awesome predators. All right. Pretty wild. Uh Hmm. Mm -hmm. Miss Deer's class, Virginia, your Ooh. microphone is on. Hey there. All right, ready, Michael? Go for it, sir. Um, one of my questions I have, one of the questions I have are, what are some difference between nocturnal animals and the animals that are awake during the daytime, other than the fact that of the time that they're awake? Yeah, that, that's a pretty good question, actually. Um, really interesting. So from what I see um, that's kind of interesting is a lot of the, the animals that we associate with daytime, so the, the monkeys, the primates in particular, um, are quite often group living and they're very, very social. Um, and so you'll get, you know, you could see a troop of squirrel monkeys of over 100 easy out here in the Ossa Peninsula. Um, 
But when we think about the the diurnal species, uh, the nocturnal species, sorry, like kinkajous, porcupines, olingos, they tend to be more solitary. Um, not completely. They're still they still interact, and sometimes you'll still see two or three of them, but not in giant social groups. Um, they're much more cryptic um, uh, and sort of um, not living in groups. So I think group size is a kind of interesting one that initially comes to mind about the difference. Um, but obviously just the way in which they, they're adapted to their environments as well. So nocturnal animals usually have huge eyes um, that, that allow moonlight in particular to come in so they can actually move around at night time. Um, whereas a lot of the diurnal species have much smaller eyes um, and they're more skilled at detecting um, maybe differences in colors so that they can find out when fruits are ripening. Um, maybe the nocturnal species rely more on a, a sense of smell. All right, another great question. So Andy, before we get you to lower down for us, I want to pop one more question in. Uh, and about, it's about new species. Obviously, in a place like the canopy of the rainforest, there is so much left to explore, to discover, tons of species waiting to be found. Have you uh, played a role or, or discovered any yourself? Um, yeah, actually, um, I, I have. Um, not yet here in Costa Rica. We recently found a butterfly, um, not me, but one of my, my students, um, that could be not maybe a new species to cost. It's probably a new species to Costa Rica, could be a new species to science, but we're not sure yet. But when I was in uh, when I was in working in the Amazon rainforest, we did find a species of poison dart frog that was new to science. And we we published a paper about um, two years ago uh, describing that new species of poison dart frog. National Geographic actually did a, a story about that poison dart frog, and uh, I'll send you the link later. Um, but I have found a few uh, frogs and lizards in particular that are new species to science. And I'm sure um, there are many new species that you can find in the canopy, especially if you're interested in insects. Yeah. And uh, just a side note for the students, as I'm sure you can attest to, Andy, it's not just a matter of, hey, a new species and it's done, it can sometimes take years for it to be verified and papers to be written yeah. before you get to name it and all that other fun stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of work involved. So you've got to visit museums to look at existing specimens so that you can be certain that what you're seeing is new. You've got to look at how physically, how different is the frog? Maybe there's differences in the way that they call and they vocalize. And then sometimes you need to more frequently now do some genetic testing as well and look at the DNA. So it's kind of a very, what we call a holistic approach where you're looking at multiple different aspects. All right, well, Andy, this has been incredible. The classrooms had awesome questions, uh, great display of dexterity getting that camera trap mounted. <laughs> uh, but I think it's time to see how you get down. All right, well, so I'm sitting on a branch right now. You can kind of see I'm perched, so it's nice and comfortable. So I'm just gonna, throw myself off and swing around. <laughs> so I'm going to be like, it's probably going to make you guys a bit seasick. So what I'm going to try and do is hold myself with, uh, with a selfie stick and then just gently, I'm just pulling on this lever and you guys should see me start to go down. So it's kind of like abseiling. So you can see the canopies disappearing. I'm now like, getting down into some of the understory. And you'll see some cool, on the, on the ficus tree here, you can see some cool epiphytes. So these, these plants that are really understudied up here in the canopy. And we see lots of orchids and bromeliads and it's a really great place if you're interested in plants as well. So I'm just gonna keep going. So I'm getting out of all of the big branches now. You can see everything's kind of disappearing. And there we go. You'll start to see the ground appearing. This is the fun bit when you're in the mid canopy and you start going through all the, the leaves.
going down is much easier than coming up. <laughs> and sometimes I'll be climbing, see things get stuck on the branches. There we go. And then sometimes I'll be climbing maybe four or five trees a day. <laughs> there we go. And we should start to see the buttress of the tree appearing. There we go. I'm on the ground. Ah, all right. All That's right. That's where I was. And now I'm on the ground. Very cool. So, well, Andy, that was a blast. Thanks so much for doing this for us today. No worries. No worries. Great questions by everybody, by the way. They were awesome. All right. Well, the last thing we usually do, Andy, is we turn all the microphones on. We let the, let the classrooms get loud. A big goodbye and thank you. And then we'll sign off for today. Awesome. All right. Microphones are coming on, boys and girls. Let's get loud. <laughs> Excellent job, as per usual, boys and girls. Uh, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Andy, thank you so much. That was incredible. We love when we can do stuff like this live with classrooms. And uh, yeah, we definitely look forward to future events. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, everyone, for today. We are going to sign off from today's uh, hangout.